In this video, I'm going to give a primer on variational calculus, which is an extremely powerful and elegant technique, similar to differential calculus, only instead of finding a point that minimizes a function, we now want to find a function that minimizes a function. First, and in order to understand things a little bit more clearly in terms of the chronological order, I thought I would give a brief history. Round about 1670, calculus was invented by either Newton or Leibniz, depending on who you believe, but it's now thought that they invented it simultaneously but completely separately from one another. In 1686, Newton publishes his Principia Mathematica, which is the first text on classical mechanics. This is where he first publishes his three laws, and as a result, classical or Newtonian mechanics is born. In 1696, Johann Bernoulli, the brother of Jacob Bernoulli, posed the brachista crone problem. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in this video. His brother Jacob also spent some time working on this problem, but it wasn't until 1733 that Euler first elaborated on the brachista crone problem. Euler, in case you weren't aware, was quite the mathematician of his time. Then in 1743, D'Alembert, the guy with a principle, he reformulates, in essence, Newton's second law as a sum of forces equal to zero. It's a little bit more involved than that, but that's the basic idea. And then in 1755, a guy named Lagrange, at the age of 19, is studying a problem known as the Tortochrone problem, which is a variation of the Brachistochrone problem. He is greatly influenced by Euler and writes to him and at the same time publishes a paper explaining a method of analyzing such a problem. Euler is so impressed that he drops his current method of doing it, which involves geometry, and switches to Lagrange's method, which is purely analytical. Bear in mind that Euler is a man of about 48, 49 at the time, and really distinguished. His well-known Euler formula had been published a few years before that. And Lagrange is a 19-year-old teenager. And yet Euler changes everything based on Lagrange's research, he even goes ahead and delays publishing a paper of his on the subject to allow Lagrange to catch up and start publishing his own work because he realized that Lagrange has it right. And just a year later, in 1756, Euler publishes a paper on the calculus of variations, as he now calls it. And this has taken Lagrange's equations and has tried to extend it and generalize it a little bit for a much wider range of problems. Let's put a box around that, since that's the central point of this. And then in 1788, Lagrange publishes his Mécanique Analytique, a classical mechanics paper, which is the seminal paper on the subject that has been published since Newton. And Lagrange has fundamentally put forth a different method of analysis than Newton, whereby the equations of motion can be derived by considering certain mechanics problems as minimization problems. More about that later in this video. And then finally, several years later in 1834, Hamilton is examining specifically Lagrange's form of the problem, where he's minimizing a Lagrangian, and he extends it to all sorts of problems, and it has applications way beyond the classical mechanics problems to problems in electromagnetism and quantum theory. Okay, enough about the history. Let's get down to some business. Variational calculus, a primer. First of all, what is our motivation here? Well, variational calculus addresses a wide array of minimization type problems. But for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to reduce this to path minimization type problems. So consider you have two points. We'll name it A and B, and point A is at a coordinate x1, y1, and point B is at a coordinate x2, y2. Now, if I said find the minimum length path between those, you would know immediately that that's a straight line, and that would be the optimum path if I was trying to minimize the distance. But what if I was trying to minimize something else? For example, what if I had a chain? What if a chain was hanging between A and B? What shape would that take? Does anyone know? Well, let me ask you this. Why, if I had a chain like this, why does a chain hang down and not up? It hangs down and not up because that minimizes its potential energy. So the chain will hang in a shape that minimizes its potential energy, which is kind of obvious it would be a U shape. 
if it's a symmetric problem. But what about the case of this problem? We might think, well, that would be a viable shape if the path we were choosing was to minimize the potential energy as opposed to minimizing the distance. We would expect a chain to hang in a similar sort of shape to that shown. Well, what about another sort of problem? The brachistochrome problem suggests that if I've got, say, a marble or a ball rolling down a slope from A to B, what is the shape of the slope that will minimize the time taken from A to B, assuming it's just falling under gravity? And the answer to that is not immediately obvious. In fact, many smart people have spent a long, long time studying this problem, and it was this problem that gave rise to the calculus of variations. But you might think maybe it's a path like the red one that would be the shortest path if what we're trying to minimize is the time taken from A to B. And maybe yet for another problem that we're trying to minimize, this blue path from A to B might be the minimum path. So the idea of variational calculus is we're trying to find a path that minimizes some sort of a function. But what is a path? A path is just a function. So in fact, we're trying to find a function that minimizes a function. And this is the difference between variational calculus and differential calculus. In the case of differential calculus, we're finding a point that minimizes a function. In the case of variational calculus, we're trying to find a path or a function that minimizes another function. So in general, we're dealing with minimizing path type of problems. So what's one example? Well, the green path, minimizing the distance is an example. How would we proceed with something like this? In each case, we're going to define an integral that we're trying to minimize. We'll call this integral i in all cases. And the integral in this case is just the integral from x1 to x2 of ds, where ds is the incremental path length. And let's just draw a quick diagram to remind ourselves if, if ds is the incremental path length, we know from Pythagoras that ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. We can take a dx squared out and write it as dx squared times 1 plus dy over dx squared. And then taking the square root of both sides gives us an expression for ds. Plugging that in gives us the integral from x1 to x2 of square root 1 plus y prime for shorthand squared dx. Let's give these some numbers, number 1 and 2. A second example would be, as we said, to minimize the time taken from A to B, assuming this is falling under gravity, otherwise known as the Brachistochrone problem. In this case, we might define the integral I as the integral from x1 to x2 of ds divided by the velocity, since the time taken is just the distance divided by the velocity. And then this can be rewritten as the integral from x1 to x2 of root 1 plus y prime squared divided by root 2g times y1 minus y dx, where the velocity is found by using the potential and kinetic energies. We'll number that 3. Yet another minimization type problem might be to minimize the potential energy, as we mentioned before, the hanging rope problem, also commonly known as the catenary problem. And that is, if I hang a rope of a specific length between those two points, what is the exact shape that it hangs in? And we said it before, what we need to minimize is the potential energy. So our integral in this case, I, would be defined as the integral from x1 to x2 of mgh. m in this case is rho a, and h is y, the height, ds. We can bring rho a out. So it's rho a integral from x1 to x2 of y root 1 plus y prime squared dx. Number that 4. And this is subject to the constraint that the length of the rope is a known given constant. So L is equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of the incremental path length, which is just 1 plus y prime squared square root dx. And let's just remind you that this is a constraint equation, but in principle it's still the same idea. We minimize it the same way. And then finally, the fourth example would be minimizing the Lagrangian. And this is what yields Lagrange's equations. And we've seen this in previous videos, that we have this quantity L called the Lagrangian, which is the difference between the kinetic and potential energy of a system. And it was shown by Lagrange and later expanded upon by Hamilton, that in moving from one time to another, a system will follow a path of stationary points with respect to the Lagrangian. That is to say, at any given time, it will follow a path that minimizes the Lagrangian.
In this case, the integral is just equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of the Lagrangian, which is a function we've seen previously. It's the kinetic minus the potential energy, and in general will be a function of x, y, and y prime, dx. I remind you that i is a functional because it is a function of a function. i is a function of y and its derivative, which are functions. Okay, so now that all the talk is over, let's get down to a little bit of mathematics. What is the basic idea behind the calculus of variations? Well, assuming we have a point x1, y1, and a second point x2, y2, let's assume, I'm going to draw in black, this is the optimal path from x1 to x2. We're minimizing some integral that this path is the solution, it's the optimal path, and we're going to call that y of x. And then what we want to do, because we want to consider all other paths, is we come up with some purely arbitrary path, which I'll draw in red, and we call that path eta of x. Eta of x is some random function that goes from point 1 to point 2, and it's completely arbitrary other than it must start at point 1 and it must end at point 2. Then we can scale that by a factor we call epsilon, which is some small number, and we call this difference epsilon times eta, and this could be thought of as the variation of y. So y is the perfect path, and epsilon times eta is the variation of y. Eta is really a shape function, an arbitrary shape function, and epsilon is the magnitude. And in this way, we are in effect parametizing a whole family of possible curves that could be the correct solution. And a reminder here is that the function eta is twice differentiable. So I'm going to write that y bar, which is just an arbitrary path, is the sum of y, which is the perfect optimum path, plus epsilon times eta of x. So again, I've parametized an entire family of curves based on the fact that I get to pick a y of x, which is the ideal path, so that must remain fixed. And then I arbitrarily pick an eta of x, and by shifting the value of epsilon, I can account for a whole family of arbitrary curves. Okay, so in effect, I'm varying y by adding this variational bit called epsilon eta. And this is not all that different to where we consider differential slices of x, and at the other end, x plus dx. It's a little bit like that. dx, in that case, is considered the differential of x, Epsilon eta is considered the variation. So the variation is like the differential, but for functionals instead of functions. Let's give this a number. Uh, we're up to number five. So I'm just going to remind you again that eta is arbitrary. It's the arbitrary variation of y, but it must satisfy the two boundary conditions, such that eta at x1 and eta at x2 are zero. And you can see this in the figure that the variation, eta, has got to be zero at each of the boundary conditions, because these are geometric boundary conditions, in which case they specified there can be no variation at the boundaries as a result of this. And just for good measure, because I know I'm going to need it later, I'm going to take the derivative of equation 5, which says simply that y bar prime, this is the derivative with respect to x, that y bar prime is equal to y prime plus epsilon eta prime. Let's give these numbers 6 and 7. Okay, so based on the problems I showed in the previous couple of slides, we showed that each of these integrals can be written as the integral from x1 to x2 of a functional, some function of, in general, x, y, and or y prime. And if you look at the previous four examples I gave, you'll see that each one of them is a function of one of these functions or derivatives. Uh, we need a dx and equation 8. All right, so here is the crux of it. Here is the foundational principle of the calculus of variations. And that is, if this path y is an optimum path, and, and in the language of calculus, we call it an extremal. If it's an extremal, then it's got to be a stationary point. In other words, the derivative of this function must be zero. Just like we would do in the case of differential calculus, we set the derivative equal to zero. So we say the derivative of i with respect to epsilon, and let me just remind you that as epsilon goes towards zero, let's look here at equation five, as epsilon goes towards zero, y bar goes to the exact solution. So we expect that in the neighborhood of epsilon equal to zero, this integral i must have a stationary point. So let me say that again. 
In order to minimize, and I'm going to blow the punchline here, these are all minimization problems, but you need to show that through the second derivative or the second variation. But in order to find an extremal, we need to set the variation of i with respect to epsilon to zero. And let me just remind you that when I make this substitution for y, y of x, this is constant because it's the optimum path. It's an extremal and it doesn't change. This is arbitrary, but once we pick it for the problem, remains constant. So the only thing that gets to be varied is epsilon. So this is actually a whole derivative, a, a complete derivative. It's not a partial derivative. And I'm making a point here. It seems like such a minor detail, but all the explanations I see for this really gloss over this part of it. And this is really the fundamental concept of all of this, is that in order to find this minimum path, we need to set the derivative of this function, i, this integral, equal to zero around that extremal point of epsilon equals to zero. Let me write it out and it will become a little more clear. So this is just the derivative with respect to epsilon of the integral in equation eight from x1 to x2 of the functional f dx. And that must be set equal to zero. This is the foundation of variational calculus. We'll call that equation nine. And then what we can do is we can move this derivative inside the integral. All I've done is I've moved this derivative here. And this can be done, it's actually Leibniz's rule. And you know, when Leibniz says something, I mean, this is the guy that invented calculus. So we need to take it seriously. According to Leibniz's rule, we can bring this derivative inside the integral because we have constant integration points. Let's call this number 10. Okay, so no great mystery here. All we've done is we've said we need to take the derivative of i with respect to epsilon. And I'll remind you that the functional f is now a function of y bar and y bar prime because I've gone ahead in theory and made this substitution in equation 5. Okay, I don't want to confuse you too much now. Let's go on with it, and then I'm going to come back and review the whole thing quickly. So turning the page, let's copy over equation 10. So this is equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of, and in order to take the derivative, we need to take the derivative with respect to each coordinate. So it's partial f partial x times partial x partial epsilon, but x is not a function of epsilon, so that is zero, plus partial f partial y bar times partial y bar partial epsilon, plus partial f partial y bar prime times partial y bar prime partial epsilon. At epsilon equals zero, dx equals zero. We'll call this equation 11. And then from equation five, this was equation five, that y bar is y of x plus epsilon eta. If we take the derivative of y bar with respect to epsilon, the answer is eta. Call that number 12, put a box around it. And then similarly, from equation 7, if we take the derivative of y bar prime with respect to epsilon, the answer is eta prime. Call that 13. Put a box around it. Now, by substituting 12 and 13 in here, we can rewrite this as the integral from x1 to x2 of partial f partial y bar times eta plus partial f partial y bar prime times eta prime at epsilon equals 0 dx. And that must all equal 0 number 14. So I remind you again that we need to go ahead and evaluate this at epsilon equals zero. And most people do not explain this. This is the crux of what's going on here, is that as epsilon approaches zero, so this variation on the solution approaches the exact solution. So let's write that mathematically. At epsilon equals zero, y bar is exactly y, and y bar prime is y prime. In other words, the solution approaches the exact solution as epsilon goes to zero. Therefore, we can rewrite equation 14 from the previous page as such, where the y bars have now become y's and y primes. This equation represents the first variation of f, and is also known to be its weak form. The reason it's its weak form is because we've got an eta prime here, and not an eta. In order to get this into its strong form, what we need to do is integrate this term here by parts. And I remind you that by integrating by parts, we can take the derivative off the eta and apply it to the df dy prime. Just a little reminder and a side note that the integral from a to b of u dv 
is equal to v times u evaluated at points a and b minus, don't forget that's a minus sign, the integral from a to b of v du. So in effect, what I've done is I've transferred the derivative from the v to the u over here. And in order to do that, I needed to flip the sign and I needed to get this boundary term. So let's apply that to the problem at hand. This implies that df dy prime eta evaluated at x1 and x2, and this is zero in both cases, because remember in equation six, we defined it that way. We said that eta at x1 and at x2 was zero. Plus the integral from x1 to x2 of this part here, partial f, partial y, I'll take the eta out, minus, and we're going to take the derivative now of this part, so d by dx of partial f, partial y prime, times eta, times dx, and that's got to be equal to zero. This now appears in its strong form because we're only multiplying eta, and we've got rid of the eta prime. And now this is one of the core pieces of calculus of variations, that because eta is arbitrary, and let me just write this, the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. But because the eta is arbitrary, therefore, all of that must equal to zero. So let's write that out. Partial f partial y minus d by dx of partial f partial y prime is equal to zero. This is equation 15, and that is the Euler-Lagrange equation. It's considered by many to be one of the most beautiful equations in all of classical mechanics. In fact, Hamilton described it as a scientific poem. And this formula, this equation, has applications way beyond what it was originally intended for, which was Lagrangian mechanics. And to those of you who have seen the videos where we've used Lagrange's equations, it should be pretty easy to see that if we replace our x by time t, and we replace our y's and y primes by q's and q dots, then this is exactly Lagrange's equations. Of course, Lagrange didn't derive it this way. Lagrange got to the same result, but derived it using D'Alembert's principle. But as a result of deriving it, Euler was then able to expand on this whole concept, and this is what they came up with. Truly one of the most beautiful equations in all of mechanics. Okay, and that's it. We're done. Now, I know for many of you who are perhaps seeing this just for the first time, this has probably just set your mind spinning. So I'm going to go back through it from the beginning so that it can flow and we can look at what the important concepts are here. Going back to the start of the math, we discovered that in many cases we would like to minimize an integral. And I showed various examples of minimization problems. In particular, we have a special affinity for those problems that minimize the Lagrangian. And we've seen in previous videos examples of how powerful that can be. So what we did is we assumed that y of x was the exact solution, was the optimal path or the extremal. We decided to add a slight variation to that, which we called epsilon times eta. We recognized that the functional that we're dealing with in general was a function of x, y, and y prime. In order to find the extremal or the optimal path, we set the derivative of i with respect to epsilon equal to zero. In order to take the derivative of a function or a functional that is a function of x and y bar and y bar prime, we took the derivative with respect to each component individually. We recognized that this one canceled out because there was no variance of x. In other words, x did not vary with epsilon at all. And then we further recognized that we could reduce these derivatives to eta and eta prime respectively. Substituting that into the equation then gave us the weak form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, which was this. In order to get it to the strong form, we integrated this term by parts. We applied the boundary conditions here, and I wanted to show you, I remind you, that the reason that those boundary conditions are zero is because we set them equal to zero. We said that there was no variation at the boundaries. In other words, in order for us to consider all paths, we needed to consider only those paths that began at x1 and ended at x2, because those were geometric boundary conditions. Therefore, they were prescribed. Therefore, there's no variation on them. Anyway, all of that was applied to this equation, and we found that in the end, because eta was arbitrary, which is the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations,
we then found that everything else multiplying eta must be equal to zero at all times, and this yield the Euler-Lagrange equations. Anyway, that's all I want to say about this video. I hope you found something interesting in it. If you did, please go ahead and smash those like buttons so that others can get to see it too. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. If you would like to be notified of any future video releases, please hit those subscribe buttons and click on the bells. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.